The Finance Secretary, Kate Forbes, was in the Cairngorms yesterday to set out her priorities after facing controversy last week following her comments on same-sex marriage. Last Tuesday, we questioned her about her comments and religious beliefs. Tonight, she joined us to discuss her campaign as a whole. Kate Falls, what are you offering that's different from the other candidates? I'm offering competent leadership with a vision of putting the economy front and centre of our plans for Scotland. If we're serious about delivering independence, then we need to get serious about economic growth. That will be the only way to eradicate poverty and to put our public services on a sustainable footing. You talk about a competent leadership. Does that imply that it hasn't been that so far? It implies that I bring the last few years of experience managing Scotland's budget as well as managing Scotland's economy through some of the toughest times and having the respect of the business community and I would hope workers in the way that I have done that. Right now, most households are facing the challenges of cost of living crisis. Businesses are seeing their profits being eroded and they need someone with a grip on the economy and who's serious, not just about good ideas, but about actually delivering them. And again, you, you spoke about competent leadership. You're talking about delivering an idea on ideas. Does that suggest that what went before or who's competing against you just now would not deliver that? So uh, the First Minister was, was not delivering. Uh, Hamza Youssef is perhaps not competent. Is that what you're saying? No, far from it. I have the greatest of respect for, for both of those individuals you've just mentioned. And I've, of course, served in Nicola Sturgeon's government quite happily. The key that I'm talking about right now is that as we are in throes of a cost of living crisis, we are seeing low growth, low productivity, high levels of inflation, uh, businesses are struggling, and we need a plan to give them a bit of breathing space because they're the ones that create the well-paid secure employment. Small and medium-sized businesses, the length and breadth of the country are the ones who will actually turn the tide on poverty and will raise the revenue to reinvest. And it's never been more critical than it is now to give them that space, but more than that, to unleash the potential of, of Scottish industry. And that is the experience, the track record I bring to this contest. You said you were in the Cabinet, and not only that, you were the Finance Secretary since uh, 2020. Uh, so why haven't you done that already? We have been doing that. And I think if you ask most businesses that have experience of working with me, they'll know that I've not just listened to them, but I've sought to deliver for them. But it needs to be a government-wide approach. In the last few weeks, we've seen a number of initiatives, for example, a potential ban on whiskey advertising. It's not coming from the economic directorate, but it's coming from public health. And these are laudable aims, but they need to be delivered in a way that doesn't hamstring one of Scotland's most significant industry, one of the biggest exports that doesn't just deliver for the Scottish economy, but actually attracts tourists and visitors to come to Scotland and spend money in some of our most remote and rural parts of Scotland. So it needs to be a government-wide initiative. The one word you haven't used in any of that is independence. What's your strategy? Well, I think I used it at the beginning. So at the moment, uh, there are a number of approaches to independence that I would take. First and foremost is on day one, ensure that we have a campaign team ready to go to make the case for independence. But secondly, yet again, the economy features. People want to see with their own eyes evidence that the Scottish Government is serious about the economy and about economic growth. And they also want answers to some of the questions when it comes to Scotland's future economy within independence. But lastly, and this is probably most important, and it's something else I bring, is the willingness and the ability to reach out to people that haven't yet been persuaded by the merits of independence. We, of course, need to have a conversation within the SNP, across the Yes movement, but to deliver independence, it needs to be somebody who can inspire the confidence of those yet to be persuaded. And that's something that I also bring, a willingness to build bridges and to reach out and to listen rather than insult or offend. So you're not talking about independence anytime soon. That's a long, that's a long project you're talking about. No, I think independence will come, and I think independence will come soon. But it won't come uh, how soon, without then? the ground. Just give us, an, give us an idea well, how soon. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a prophetess and I don't have a crystal ball. What I'm committed to doing is laying the groundwork, to laying out on day one the mission for a campaign team to make a case for independence, 
to make independence front and centre of the next uh, Westminster election and to build the case. There are so many people in Scotland who believe in Scotland flourishing and prospering. Some of them don't support independence yet. I think they can be persuaded okay. with the right approach. I, I accept it, that you're saying that, but what makes you think that can happen soon? Well, I think it's about building the case. It's about stopping talking about processes and independence as a constitutional abstract theory and instead saying, look, I'm speaking to you from Dingwall. Down the road there, there are families that can't afford their heating bills. And yet, right next door to them are businesses that are making millions, if not billions, from the energy industry. It doesn't add up. And it doesn't add up because energy policy has been reserved to the UK government far removed from these families for too long. Okay, but Independence is about trying to fix the issues that's that the real families for, face. That's the argument for independence, yes. But you're okay. talking about persuading people by economic uh, competence and, and uh, by proving good governance uh, and persuading people who haven't yet supported independence to turn. And you're saying that's going to happen soon. How is it going to happen soon? What makes you think that's going to happen soon? Well, because I think the argument speaks for itself, but we've got to get out there and persuade. We've got to reach out to those that might have voted no last time, but can be persuaded to vote yes next time. But the groundwork needs to be done. Look, every activist in the SNP is used to making persuasive arguments. We need to get out there and talk to people. Right so now, what people are grappling with are the cost of living and our, our public services. So does that mean... I think we need to... Sorry. Sorry, no, uh, does that mean referendums, all that, the, going to the, the court, de facto uh, general elections, all of that's gone? No, not at all. I think uh, what I've outlined already is that part of the process, beyond establishing a, a clear campaign team, mm -hmm. is focusing on the next Westminster election. And the next Westminster election needs to be used as a means of putting further pressure on the UK government. The UK government are saying no because they think they can get away with saying no. And we need to show them that they can't get away with saying no, that but, the will of the Scottish people will not be denied. But how will you do that if the, the UK government has shown no sign so far that they're going, going to move? Um, they say now is not the time. How do you persuade them otherwise? Well, first of all, we persuade the Scottish people because that is ultimately the route to a democratic outcome for independence. We persuade the Scottish people, we increase the pressure on the UK government to a level where they can no longer say And what no. is that level? And, well, that is a sustained majority support for independence. Just the majority, 50% 50, 50 plus one or more I'm not going to put a figure on it because I would like as many people as possible to support independence because I think that's healthier when it comes to building a future independent country. We, we spoke about um, you being part of the Cabinet and responsible for some of the decisions that were made, including the deposit return scheme, which you've now said is economic carnage. Why didn't you speak out before? What I said is that I support the deposit return scheme in terms of its aims, and always have done. I think the principles are sound. And incidentally, most of the businesses that are speaking out right now about the deposit return scheme have also supported the principles. The argument I've made is that its execution and implementation is still too challenging for businesses to get behind. Well, your, your uh, government colleague, uh, Circular Economy Minister Lorna Slater, said that no one with any credibility to support business would delay this scheme. So whose credibility is in question here, yours or hers? I'd ask business that question. And uh, you must have an answer say. yourself. You know, you must have an answer. I would ask business. Uh, better to ask business who they think is a more credible voice when it comes to the economy and when it comes to representing their interests. And incidentally, that's also the interest of workers. Okay. Because what businesses are saying is that the upfront costs on top of everything else they've faced means that it's really difficult to maintain the level of employment that they've been maintaining. So you're, it's about as much about employment and secure employment as anything else. You, you're resistant to much of what the Greens have brought forward to the government, uh, the deposit return scheme. Uh, you're talking of delaying that, the uh, gender recognition. And we heard um, Ash Regan uh, last night telling this programme, and she said it frequently now, uh, that essentially the tail is wagging the dog in government. The Greens have too big an influence. Would you be sorry to see the Greens leave government? 
I have been at the forefront of negotiations with the Greens probably longer than anybody else in the Scottish Government Cabinet, having introduced and negotiated three budgets. I'm very happy to work with the Greens and to continue to. Well, they wouldn't to be happy work to with work with you. They, they've said that you would cross their red lines. Well, that would be a conversation to have with them because well, would, it, would it be approach, a regret for you though? Well, I, I think it's good to see parties working together. I would like to take an approach in politics. You may think this sounds naive, but of more cross-party working. I think there are big issues facing Scotland around energy, cost of living, the NHS, which actually need us to park our politics for a moment okay. and try and get cross-party agreement. And that would be an approach that I would take to the work I do as First Minister. We asked Tomza Youssef uh, when he was on the programme about the challenges of having a young family. Um, you have a newborn child. How are you going to deal with that uh, and, and take on the, the role of party leader, First Minister, if you win? Well, there's so many mums and dads who have to juggle childcare as well as a job. And I was already planning to come back after maternity leave. That's been uh, somewhat uh, fast-tracked. But uh, I'll need to make sure that there is care. Thankfully, I've got a, a wonderful mother-in-law and a wonderful mum who are lined up to look after the baby uh, and are, are quite keen, I think, on getting as much baby time as possible. Uh, there's been a backlash to your, your faith views on gay marriage and more. You said you stand by your views, uh, but you've also apologised for causing hurt. What, what are you apologising for if you stand by it? Well, just what you've outlined um, for uh, the framing and for the way that I've uh, articulated it in the past. But I think the impression I've got over the last week is that having discussed these matters at length, I probably answered more questions on faith and, and so on in the last few days than most candidates will ever answer in a lifetime. So having answered those questions, I think it's now time to move on to talking about things like the cost of living and our public services. Kate Forbes, thanks for joining us in Scotland tonight.